Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Philip Valoy. I'm the field CTO at uh, No Name Security. Um, I'll take the first 20 minutes or so to talk about the company, what are we doing, uh, what are we focusing on, but I'll mainly dive into the concepts behind API security um, before I hand it over to my colleague, Edgar, who will sort of deep dive into the platform, show you a live demo. Um, but before we do that, let's sort of figure out who is No Name Security and why are we here. Um, so we are a startup founded in 2020. Uh, we raised about 220 million in VC funding at the moment. Um, we are based in San Jose, uh, not too far from here, but most of engineering and R&D is located in Tel Aviv. Um, we focus, as I said, on securing APIs, and we do that by integrating into a customer's existing ecosystem of security products. Um, that's why we focus so much on that partner ecosystem. Um, the last three partner ecosystem announcements that we sort of made are on the slide there. So those are IBM, Intel, and Viz. So with IBM, we actually announced an OEM agreement, so they can actually resell our solution as well as uh, advanced API security from IBM. That's sort of how they position it. Uh, with Intel, we did something interesting as well. So Intel has now something called a NetSec Accelerator card. I'm sure everybody has heard about smart NICs or DPUs and such. We can actually run our software off of that NetSec, uh, NetSec Accelerator card and do all kinds of uh, fun stuff for edge-based uh, API offloading. Uh, so that means we're sort of relevant in telco use cases, but also uh, some of the defense uh, sort of use cases as well. And then the final one there is WIS. So with WIS, we integrated uh, with their CSPM uh, platform to give us, us more context also about the infrastructure that's powering your APIs. Um, so the idea is to make sure that that context doesn't get lost and people can figure out how one sort of influences the other. We are sort of more focused on the enterprise segment, um, like larger customers, people who build their own APIs. That's sort of our target market, I should say, both in private and public sector. So we do uh, deal a lot with the public sector and sort of defense type uh, organizations as well. But they're all sort of in the bigger part of the, or the higher part of the segment when it comes to the number of APIs specifically. Um, so what do we do? So I, I, I won't deep dive into the platform just yet, just to introduce sort of the high level functionality. Um, we call it the four pillars of API security. So the first thing is discovery, figuring out how many APIs do you actually have before you can decide to look at securing them. So meaning both internal APIs, but also external APIs, north, south bound, east, west bound, and so on. Uh, then posture is about de-risking the APIs. So what is the security configuration of those APIs today? Who is using them? What kind of data are they transferring? Does that impact any regulatory requirements that you have and so on? How is traffic routed through the network? Uh, are there any misconfigurations there? So that's really the goal of that pillar. And then runtime is about looking at real-time API traffic and then using some behavioral analytics to figure out what is good versus bad behavior. And then those three pillars are focused on production, obviously. The last pillar, testing, that's focused on pre-production. So the idea is if we can help customers create secure APIs before pushing them into production um, or having them escape into production, as is more and more the case these days, then that's going to be a, a win for everybody. All right, so why APIs? So APIs are everywhere. So this is sort of the announcement from Apple WWDC a few weeks ago where they announced standby mode on iOS 17. But if you sort of look behind the covers there, you'll see that they're pulling in information from all of these different third-party services. Uh, so for example, for the 10-day weather forecast, they connect to the IBM Weather Channel. For the next hour uh, rain forecast, they pull in open source data from weather.gov. If you want to you know, power your lights, power your doors, power your garage doors, and so on, that's all done on the basis of uh, APIs. Um, I'm sure also most of you have heard about this um, Software is Eating the World article from Mark Andreessen in 2011, I believe, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, so our thesis is that APIs are sort of fueling that software that is eating the world. More and more applications today, modern applications, are built on top of, on top of APIs. If we zoom out in a little bit and look more from the enterprise angle instead of the consumer angle, if I can put it like that, we see that APIs are used from things like controlling a nuclear reactor, giving you access to PII data in the healthcare space, uh, but definitely also in banking uh, due to things like PSD2 and PSD3 types regulation. 
so that's how people exchange data these days on the basis of, uh, of APIs. Because of that, it's become a massive new um, attack surface. So APIs are everywhere. This is based on some surveys we did ourselves with 451 research, but also stats we pulled in from uh, Postman, uh, their yearly uh, survey as well. So we see that APIs are growing more than 200% year over year. If you look at the change rate of those APIs, people are pushing new versions or are adding new functionality to APIs on a, on a weekly basis. Of course, if you're sort of more, let's say, ahead of the game in terms of software development, we see people pushing out changes on a daily or maybe even hourly basis as well. In any case, they are changing a lot. And because of their very nature, they're sort of externally accessible, right? So APIs from a consumer perspective are supposed to be externally consumed. That means they're typically on the public internet. And as long as you have access to those API endpoints, they sort of become an easier target uh, because there's a pathway to those uh, APIs. And it's then up to you as a security professional to make sure that that pathway is sufficiently secured. <coughs> Looking at the number of APIs is one thing. Um, these stats are from two CDN uh, vendors, well-known CDN vendors, Akamai and Cloudflare. So Akamai puts it at 83% of the totality of their traffic across their CDN is API-based. Um, Cloudflare puts it a little bit lower, 54%. In any case, the majority of the traffic these days across those networks is API-based traffic. So it's really become a sort of almost hidden, invisible network within the network, as we call it. Um, we've focused quite a lot uh, in the past on securing that pathway because it looks like HTTP traffic. So if you talk about APIs, we mainly mean REST APIs, GraphQL APIs, SOAP APIs, and so on. They use HTTP methods to communicate and exchange data, and that's how they typically get secured in organizations as well. People put in a web application firewall that validates that traffic from a network inline perspective. And if that traffic looks valid, it gets passed. But most of the abuses don't happen at that level. They happen on the authorization and the business logic level. So even though the traffic is valid, looks valid, and passes firewalls and gateways and so on, it's still open to abuse because people are figuring out how to manipulate the API logic that gives access to data or, or applications. When I say it looks uh, familiar from a inline network security device, it's basically a GET request from uh, an HTTP perspective, very similar to what would happen if you go to the uh, tech field, a website from a browser, for example. So you request a web page and you get delivered a bunch of HTML and a bunch of JavaScript. Um, I don't actually know how the tech field, a website is built, by the way. But you get delivered this, this data and then your website is rendered on, on your device. It's a small number of calls as well, so it's fairly easy to evaluate from a security perspective. Whereas from an API perspective, it's a large number of calls, so that becomes trickier as well, but it does look very similar to normal HTTP traffic, uh, so it's really difficult to differentiate between the two. Now, it looks simple and it looks familiar, but if you sort of look behind the covers, it's really uh, integrating an entire ecosystem. So it's a difficult set of architectures that we've built on the basis of APIs, whereby depending on the functionality that you are trying to uh, use, you're calling different API endpoints, and those API endpoints have no clue what the application is actually capable of, right? So the API endpoint can deliver certain functionality like ordering something, it then will call and ask for data from the backend to initiate that order process, but it actually doesn't know how the rest of that application works. So even testing the functionality of that API is somehow disconnected from the actual backend application, which makes it even harder to sort of figure out what's going on. And now what you see on the picture here is that those inline devices, they have an extremely important role to play. Uh, all our customers, of course, have a web application firewall, and I would say the vast majority would also have an API gateway uh, already, and they do these inline checks and inline validations, but that's sort of where they stop. Like, in terms of authorization problems, business logic problems, they simply don't have that context and that insight, so that's where our security platform sort of steps in, provides that additional context, but in partnership with those uh, inline systems. 
The other thing that makes it quite difficult is there's multiple API consumption styles as well. So we typically have public facing APIs, which are used by all of us. If we go to Twitter, for example, or like watch a movie on YouTube, that's all delivered over APIs. But there's also partner based integrations. Um, today, if you're building a company, you're probably not going to build all of the functionality yourself. Let's say you're going to build a ride sharing company. You're not going to compete with Google Maps. You're just going to call the Google Maps API and integrate it into your product. But then that partner-based connection from an API perspective needs to be secured as well. So you then need to figure out, well, what's allowed on this side of the equation versus the consumer side of the equation versus as well the internal side of the equation, which is where developers interact with your APIs and add new functionality, run through their tests and so on. So if a CISO then comes in or any security professional and asks these basic questions, it's really difficult to answer those. Like how many APIs do we actually have? What's the data that's being exchanged internally versus externally? What's the security policy for a consumer versus the security policy versus a partner and so on? So that's really hard to figure out because you have to look at all of these individual components and then paste those pieces together yourself. So mentioned APIs a lot, but just to uh, make it sort of clear what we are focusing on from a no-name security perspective is we're focusing specifically on application APIs. So APIs are everywhere, that's true, but you do have, um, let's say, configuration APIs. So if you want to configure a network device these days, most likely they have an API which you can use. Maybe it's like a Python API or maybe even a REST API. Uh, if you're thinking about configuring, you know, storage or compute settings or you know, HCI-based settings or anything on the public cloud, that's all API-based as well, but it's not necessarily an application-based API. So we are more focused on that application side of the equation. We're also slowly trickling into, like, especially from a Kubernetes perspective, infrastructure APIs as well, because there is a very strong link between Kubernetes infrastructure APIs and actual applications that are consuming those and running on top of that as well. Um, We'll, we'll get into that uh, a bit more as well. So APIs are a hidden attack surface. Um, there's a lot of tooling that we've built. Um, sort of changing infrastructure requirements have led to changes in security tools. Uh, like we have cloud workload protection programs, we have CNAPs, we have uh, you know, CSPMs, we have DSPMs, we now have something called DDR uh, for uh, data protection. So there's many of those systems but none of them are focusing on that hidden part of the network, which is the APIs and how they are exchanging data. So that's sort of the angle that we're trying to uh, bring in, but integrating into that ecosystem, into that uh, framework that already exists. So our thesis is that the API is now the attack surface. Um, that's what uh, an attacker or a malicious user would typically go after first, why? If you think about the old model, where you would have to penetrate the perimeter somehow, like deploy, I don't know, a zero day attack or something, figure out how to breach the network and then get to the data, all of that is no longer required as long as you can get data out of the API. So from a attacker's perspective, why is the API important? It gives you access to data and gives you access to the functionality that you potentially want to misuse. So even though those um, let's say infrastructure pieces have changed over time. So I just put a couple of examples on the slide here. So let's say in, in 2013, you created a, an application based on an EC2 instance with block storage attached to it. Then you decided in 2015, it, it was cooler to use uh, container services attached to block storage. And now you're using a serverless platform like Lambda or something connected to S3. That's all fine. But the way the data gets pulled out of those systems is through an API. And what usually ends up happening, it's the same API versioned differently, giving you access to all of those systems. So the attack surface is actually sort of expanding over time as well, especially if you don't decommission systems, which is sort of what happens. So how did we get here? Um, the majority of people, I think it's 81% according to our research, um, uses hybrid infrastructure, meaning microservices, monolithic uh, architectures, on-premises versus public cloud and so on. 
people using microservices, if you spin up a new microservices-based architecture, you're also going to spin up a bunch of new APIs. So you're also opening up an additional part of the attack surface. If you think about continuous development, um, that's great. Um, but it also leads to continuous abandonment from an API perspective, meaning once you version APIs and you forget to decommission old versions of APIs, they linger around. They typically don't get treated as well as they should from a security perspective. So that's an, an additional entry point. Industry standards, open banking is a big one. M&A activity, you know, company that you're acquiring comes in with their own APIs. New API standards, which is something that we love to do. Like for some reason, SOAP has sort of gone out of fashion and REST is the new hot thing and then GraphQL is even better and gRPC is actually better and that's sort of what we tend to do. Actually, you just brought up something I'd never really thought about is these sort of abandoned or deprecated but never deleted APIs. That sounds to me like maybe there's an opportunity also for scanning just like open S3 buckets and everything like that. Um, is that something you do or you're like to find those, to let us know where our attack services are? Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, the first sort of pillar of the platform is discovery. And then discovery leads to building a full inventory of all of the APIs that you have. And that inventory should include then, let's say, APIs that you potentially have forgotten about. Yeah. Or in the industry, we talk a lot about zombie APIs. So, <laughs> so things that sort of, they're walking, but like nobody's paying attention to them anymore, oh, but they yeah. still give a path to data or applications. Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely the first step in all of this is giving you a comprehensive inventory of like all leaving of your APIs. back door unlocked, right? Yeah. And, but locking the front door and putting cameras on it. Yeah. So this is great. Thank you. Yeah, it's like sort of building an extension to your house and then sort of forgetting, oh, that extension has a door, but the old house also had a door. Yeah. I, I sort of forgot about it. That was literally my question. Is, <laughs> can I interrogate these old dep deprecated but not deleted API things to interrogate? Because, I mean, how many times has somebody written something and then moved on to a new project and then we've lost all of that knowledge? And then all of a sudden it's like, well, how did they get in? Oh, well, you know, they used a function call that shouldn't have been working for the last five years. Right. And another one of the things that I keep thinking about is generally in the cloud world, things get deprecated but never removed mm -hmm. because no one wants to introduce to their clients, you know, backwards incompatibility. Mm -hmm. And so they just tell you, don't use this anymore. Use version three but it almost never gets turned off because people don't pay attention to, we're deprecating this, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's also sort of implicit contract as well, right? So if Reddit starts to mess with their API and sort of what data is exposed via that Reddit API, but people have already built third-party apps yeah. to consume it, you can't really in good conscience make that move, right? So exactly. you have to sort of carry on that legacy going yeah. forward. Or make a really tough decision. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So this this is Steve. I want to pile on this this whole thread. Does your discovery also work with my third party vendors? Because I'm I'm not only have the applications that I build, but you know I'm doing my accounting or my payroll or other things with third parties that I may or may not be on top of what their APIs look like for my data. Yeah, that's a good question as well. So. Uh, today, it's sort of limited what we do in terms of third-party APIs. We can sort of give you some insight into like what are the trusted API sources that you are connecting through from our platform, sort of. Um, but our whole idea is to also like look at the data and figure out how the transactions look like. How are you manipulating what you can do with that API? To do that, we need to see unencrypted traffic. Um, so for those third-party APIs, it's definitely something that we are marching towards. But right now, our visibility there is limited, I would say. Could I go back to versioning for a moment? Isn't versioning kind of an evil? I mean, if you look <laughs> at the, if you look at the um, uh, public cloud APIs, thinking about Azure in particular, there are a lot of things marked preview that people have put into production mm -hmm. that one could probably presume are less than secure. So tell me what you think about versioning. Because Karen makes a good point. You can deprecate an API, but you kill the application that's using it, right? Mm -hmm. So no one ever does it, right? I mean, right. so if you look at public cloud APIs, they're not a model I think many developers should adopt because oh it's messy <laughs> and kind of unfortunate. So 
I'd be interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, I think to Karen's point as well, it's sort of tricky to ask for a migration. And if you're going to say, actually, now the functionality that you need uh, is no longer going to be available in version one of the API. If you actually want to do this, you have to adopt version 1.1. Um, that's a difficult conversation to have, but I, I do feel you have to sort of push through that. That's just the reality, I think, of looking at security and how it evolves, because that functionality that you may have exposed somehow is coded into the API, which right. might have been an insecurity that you've created, which you weren't aware of at that time, and now you want to get rid of that insecurity. So the question is, can I rewrite it in such a way that I can still provide that functionality and remove that that insecurity, and that's really a, a sort of coding problem that you've now that you've now created. And it's cost benefit risk. So, like, not really just the API world, but even you know, command line interfaces and functions get required parameters added to them because a new feature was added. So, yeah, if you can't deploy something, whether it's an API or a function in PowerShell or something like that, because you you have not provided that parameter. And the, there was no way to provide a usable default in case the parameter is missing. This is all sort of the, you know, we were talking today, things change. You can't just build systems on the hopefulness, the wish that life doesn't change and infrastructure doesn't change. So yeah, it, it's painful, but we've all kind of been through this even in the on-prem world. It's just, we got to choose when the change happened by upgrading. And that trade-off is, is, at least in software as a service, we don't have to wait. We get things available to us, but sometimes that incurs another pain point. But I hear you. It's a great discussion to be having about change question. management and risk, cost, benefit, and risk. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So why is the Jeff Bezos logo on the slide as well? So in, in 2002, he famously came out with this memo now called the API Mandate. But he said, like, if you want to build any service within Amazon, it has to be on the basis of a standard interface. That's how we're going to communicate going forward. So if group A develops some functionality, group B has to be able to integrate with that functionality over a standard-based interface. He didn't call it an API, but that's sort of what ended up happening. And the way he enforced that sort of decision is the last bullet point of the memo he sent out was, like, if you don't do this, you're fired. So that's sort of what kicked off this entire movement uh, to this place where we sort of ended up being as well.